Hello, IFF students. I hope you're doing well. Welcome to the fourth and final lecture in our series on the limits of government. For starters, I'd just like to express my regret uh, that this uh, lecture is not going to be in person. My children got sick over Easter and in the course of taking care of them, I too fell down with a stomach bug. Um, very inconvenient. Um, and I just want to say I, I really enjoyed um, spending time with you in person and was looking forward to our last class together. And uh, I wish you all the best of luck. I know many of you are seniors moving on to bigger and brighter things. Those of you who are not, just I'm teaching a class on the Congress next spring if you're interested. Uh, and also, please remember when you watch this lecture to shoot me a quick email, j.p.cost at gmail.com. Let me know that you watch the, uh, watch the lecture. So... The lecture, as you can see, is the fourth and final question in the series of questions that we've been asking. How should disputes over violations about the liberal order be arbitrated? So what do I mean by that? I mean, when the government has moved beyond its appropriate limits, what do we do? Where do we go? Who decides how and why and when and where the government will fall back in line? And the answer today is obvious to anybody who pays attention to American politics, the courts, right? The courts make that decision. I mean, just today or just yesterday, the mask mandate was lifted because a judge in Florida decided that the, that the government, the uh, Federal Aviation Administration didn't have the constitutional authority to uh, force people to wear masks on airplanes and public transportation. So that'd be an example. The government overstepped its boundaries and was rebuked by the court. That's, that's what we take for granted today. Uh, but that is not the original way that the government was going to be police. And what today's lecture is going to take us into is a subfield of political science called American political development. How is it that American institutions of governance evolve as they do? The Constitution, of course, sets the broad framework. But within that broad framework, there are ambiguities and there are things that are open to interpretation. And a lot of times the way things end up becoming the norm is a process of back and forth. That's what we're going to look at today. And we're going to look at a couple different ways in which this question has been answered over the course of American history with a special emphasis on the period between the founding and the Civil War. Uh, after the Civil War, you see we lock in pretty pretty well with the Supreme Court. We're going to talk about that too. And one of the things I really want to highlight for you at the outset is that when we're talking about these various ways this question can be answered, how should disputes over violations about the liberal order be arbitrated? People who offered particular answers to that question were doing so on the basis of policy preferences or institutional preferences. This is an important thing to bear in mind about all political theory and, frankly, legal theory and why I encourage you whenever you're reading an author to understand where they're coming from in their place and time. That's not to delegitimize their arguments, but historical context can offer meaningful insights into the nature of the argument. And what we're going to see here is that the different answers that were proffered were proffered for specific policy or institutional reasons. That this was not, you know, like Moses coming down uh, from the mountaintop with with the Ten Commandments that amounted to a judicial review. That in fact, what we see is the development of judicial review really coming from an evolution and a sort of a series of competing ideas. Okay, so we're going to go over those, and then at the end, I'm going to just offer you some food for thought and considerations about things. So to start, we have to recognize if there's a gap in the Constitution. There's a lot of gaps in the Constitution, but there's an important one that exists vis-a-vis -vis the policing of our rights, okay? The Constitution has no clear mechanism to resolve disputes over what is and was it, what is inconsistent with the foundational document, all right? So what do I mean by that? That if, if the states disagree about the breadth of the Interstate Commerce Clause, what do they do about it? It's not really clear. That's not really clear. Now, to be fair, um, a lot of the Constitution is uh, self-effectuating, right? Delaware's never gonna send three senators to the Senate. 
but we'll get into the number of ambiguous clauses that are up for uh, various interpretations. Now, James Madison, in his original draft, which is one of your assigned readings, proposed what, of what was known as a Council of Revision, which is based off the New York State Constitution at the time. And the idea behind the Council of Revision was that the president and select members of the judiciary would review legislation for its prudence. In other words, is this good law? And also its constitutionality. In other words, is it consistent with the meaning and spirit of the Constitution on a plain understanding? Now, this would have been a way to resolve disputes. And importantly, and this is consistent with Madison's overall political philosophy, Congress retained a two-thirds veto. So who, who had final authority over the meaning of the Constitution? Ultimately, Congress, and by extension, the people themselves. And we're going to see later on when we talk about Madison's vision of how to resolve disputes, Madison returns to a version of this. Madison ultimately thinks that politics should be the way through which disputes over the meaning of the Constitution should be resolved. Right? But this idea was voted down, and pretty overwhelmingly, Madison was very disappointed about this. It was voted down, and so we don't really have a mechanism. Let's say one group thinks that this is a constitutional action, one group thinks it's not a constitutional action. How do we resolve this dispute? All right. And like I said, while most of the Constitution is self-effectuating, there are vague phrases that require interpretation. Like what? Like interstate commerce. There's different ideas of what interstate commerce means. I mean, for instance, um, you know, there's John Marshall's notion of interstate commerce in Gibbons v. Ogden. There's, you know, which I, I'm pretty sure Clarence Thomas thinks was badly decided. You know, you could look at an even more expansive version in Wickard v. Filburn, which basically you know, said that if you're growing wheat for personal use, you're not buying wheat on the commercial markets and therefore you're subject to commercial regulation. There's also the General Welfare Clause. Congress has the power to lay and collect duties for the general welfare. So what does that mean? Does that include internal improvements, for instance? We say today, yes, the answer is yes. So Congress can spend money to build roads. But you know, in the 18-teens, Madison didn't think that that was constitutional. And then also the no notion of the Supremacy Clause. It's the supreme law of the land. You know, what does that mean? It seems straightforward, but we're going to get into it. Calhoun, John C. Calhoun, uh, Vice President under John Quincy Adams and uh, under Andrew Jackson as well, and the leader of the nullifiers, is going to have a radically different understanding of what supreme law of the land means. All right, so there are vague phrases that do not admit of an obvious, uh, an obvious, you know, understanding. Now, it, this is compounded by the nature of the Bill of Rights, right, and the addition of the Bill of Rights. Now, there is a minimal Bill of Rights included in Article One, Section Nine. It's a very brief list of things Congress is not allowed to do. They're not allowed to uh, do bills of attainder. They're not allowed to do ex post facto laws, right? But this is an important point. Constitution, you need to appreciate the timing here. Constitution is adopted in Philadelphia in 1787, September 17th, with the basic in institutions of government and their institutional arrangements set. Does not have a Bill of Rights outside the mini Bill of Rights in Article 1, Section 9. All right. It's only through the process of ratification that the compromise is reached over Bill of Rights. Basically, what happens is the Federalists who were in charge of the convention weren't really all that thrilled with the idea of a Bill of Rights. Opponents of the Constitution thought there should be a Bill of Rights, and it was an easy compromise for the Federalists to make. This is how one of the reasons James Madison goes from being a skeptic of the Bill of Rights to the author of the Bill of Rights, or at least the editor. It wasn't that big a deal from his perspective. It was an easy thing to give them. You know, the worst case scenario from Madison's perspective is that a Bill of Rights would do no good. He wasn't worried that it would do harm. Right. Now, of course, as we know, the Bill of Rights has done enormous good in limiting government, but it creates a whole new set of phrases and ideas that require interpretation. I mean, it's all through there. The right to keep and bear arms. What kind of arms? Right? You know, your 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 right against um, search and seizure without probable cause. What amounts to probable cause? Or your right to due process under law. What does that mean? Even the phrase cruel and unusual itself is contextualized and situated within a given social circumstance. One, you know, people group's understanding of cruel is going to differ from another's, right? So 
You know, there's no, uh, I mean, both cruel and unusual sort of say worse than the average. Well, the average is going to shift. These words were not drawn out of thin air. That's important to understand. They didn't just pluck these words. They come from the Anglo-American legal tradition. Okay, So there would be a common understanding, right? Like due process, for instance, is the process that you're, everybody gets when they go to trial, whatever the standard process is. Okay. But there can be fuzziness at the margins. And if you've ever taken a common law class, you'll know that there is, uh, especially in the 20th century, especially after the Bill of Rights was quote unquote incorporated, such that you know it began to apply to the state. There were all sorts of questions regarding the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth, the Sixth, the Seventh, and the Eighth, uh, the rights of criminal defendants. Right? So the question becomes, we have all these fuzzy words in the Constitution that are not immediately obvious. How are disputes about the meaning of these words and phrases and ideas resolved? Because that is ultimately going to determine how the limits of government are maintained. Right? And there's no clear mechanism within the Constitution. Now, to be clear, you know there are indications of mechanism. The fact that the president has the power to veto a piece of legislation. You know, if he thinks a piece of legislation is unconstitutional, he's duty bound to veto it because he takes an oath of office to uphold, protect, and defend the Constitution. Right? Likewise, the judiciary uh, has the authority to hear cases and controversies, as the Constitution says, arising under the laws of the United States and the Constitution. So obviously the, Sup the Supreme Court, the courts in general, are going to have say in what the Constitution means, and by extension, what the limits of government are. But of course, what if the President and the Supreme Court disagree? Who has the final say? See, that's the interesting question. And that's where Madison's Council of Revision would have answered it. Right? Ultimately, he wanted to give it, you know, the final say being the supermajority of Congress or a combination of the executive and the judiciary. Uh, personal opinion, I think Madison's Council of Revision would have been a great idea. All right? And like I mentioned this a moment ago, early on, Washington, as first president, felt responsibility for this himself. The question of the legality of the Bank of the United States, Washington was uncertain. So he asked Jefferson for an opinion. He asked Hamilton. He asked Edmund Randolph. I mean, Washington was sort of like a judge soliciting briefs. It's exactly what he was like. All right. Uh, today, we take judicial review. I should say, this should say as the answer. right? So this is sort of settled in our constitutional system. But the point that I'm trying to make is that it was settled over the process of a fairly long amount of time and really was not finalized until the South lost the Civil War. See, because the South's view of the limits of government and who got to police the limits of government right, justified their decision to secede from the Union. Right? So ultimately, this does not get answered finally, in my opinion, until, uh, until the Civil War. Right? So we have a couple options here. I mean, we could take Washington as one. Uh, but Jefferson and later Calhoun suggested the doctrine of nullification, that because states are the parties to the constitutional compact, right? The constitution is a contract binding the states together. So therefore, the states should have the authority. And if the states judge a law to be unconstitutional, contrary to the limits embodied in the constitution, then they can hold within their boundaries that it's null and void and of no force. That, that's one solution. We're going to talk about that. Madison, as I illustrated already, suggests politics, right? The political back and forth, Madison sort of, if you envision, sort of Madison kind of, if you take Federalist 10, Federalist 51, uh, and that's sort of the, the scrappy political battles that are going to happen in the mass public as envisioned by Federalist 10, and the sort of uh, an analogous conflict among elites that he sketches out in Federalist 51. I would say Madison's view is that between the two of these processes, you're going to get something reasonable approximating the limits of government right uh marshall suggests judicial review john marshall um and which wins out but really like i said only after the civil war we're going to talk about all three of them and this is again this sort of gets back to you know it's my overall sort of overarching thesis here is that each of these ideas is articulated in the midst of a political crisis not a crisis necessarily on the magnitude of the civil war uh, Marshall really just mostly finds himself in a pickle, right? Uh, but some sort of problem. And the solutions that each of them offer, while they're consistent, I think, with their overarching beliefs, are inherently political. As a matter of fact, I think you can explain. I, I would say Calhoun's views shifted entirely 
uh, from his early years in Congress. Calhoun came into Congress in 1810. He was a strong nationalist and reflective of the fact that South Carolina at that point was well integrated into the Union. But as the Industrial Revolution occurs, or begins to occur, you get the market revolution, South Carolina finds itself on the outside looking in. And Calhoun's views changed entirely, such that the Calhoun of, say, 1815 and the Calhoun of 1835 are basically unrecognizable from one another. Right? And the point here is that nothing is based solely on abstract dispassionate reasoning. Even though if you read, um, you know, if you read Calhoun, I think I gave you his Fort Hill address to read. Calhoun's going to make it seem like he's just plucking these capital T truths from out of the ether. Uh, but, you know, the, the idea here I want you to get, get to is that these ideas are situated in a given place and time with specific political contexts that are deriving these uh, so these particular ways of interpreting the Constitution. So why does this matter? Well, it matters because there's a bigger issue at stake here than simply checks and balances, right? Can the president do this? Can Congress do this? Right. What matters is the pur purpose of a liberal government is to protect your rights. And a liberal government inherently implies limits. There's things that it's not supposed to do. All right. When and how can we identify instances where this has happened? And what do we do about it? Right. That's the question, really, ultimately, that we're asking in this fourth class. And that is why it relates in, like, if you think about the classes, we've sort of gone along. Right. What's the purpose of government? What limits a liberal government? Uh, so we talked about the idea of government as an entity and what it's supposed to do and the competing views on that. We talked more specifically about the purpose of a liberal government. We talked about how to design a liberal government. And this is sort of an extension on that last question. What do we do when there's disagreements about what the government has done? All right. Now, Jefferson, and this is an important point as well. You know, the Declaration of Independence is a fun read, right? Because it's really a knocking down of the old order. Uh, and so Jefferson can be at his the peak of his rhetorical powers because all the Declaration does is tear down what existed, which is easy to do, right? It's easy to demolish a house, much more difficult than to build one up, right? And in the Declaration of Independence, obviously Jefferson acknowledges right to revolution, Right. That's in the famous sort of phrase, you know, that we hold these truths to be self-evident and he goes on through and that the final self-evident truth is that if government's not protecting your rights, you have a right to leave. But then, and this is interestingly the part that people don't remember as much, Jefferson kind of taps the brakes after he says that. He says something interesting. He says, prudence indeed, by the way, that word prudence, incredibly important for understanding early modern political philosophy, right? Prudence is the idea of practical wisdom, right? Not book learning, but wisdom learned from the art of politics or from the lessons of experience, all right? Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient con causes. So in other words, like I'll give you an example. Uh, my street, they changed, the street that I live on in Zillianople, they changed it from a two lane street to one lane street, which is incredibly annoying to me because rather than, I you know, I, I have to, you know, cause it's sort of one lane going southbound, but in the morning I need to get to school going northbound. So I have to do it like a loop around. It's very annoying. That does not give me a right to revolution, right? I cannot just declare my house independent of the borough of Zodiopal. That would be a light cause, right? That would be a light cause. A transient cause would be a cause that doesn't last me. Okay, so can't just tear down a government for no good reason. And he says, accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. So in other words, people generally don't revolt even if maybe they do have a right to. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object of is designed to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. So what's Jefferson saying? Is that you have a right to revolution but he's only laying it out clearly in a very narrow set of circumstances. It's not just a long train of abuses and usurpations, right? Like mistreatment of you and seizing your rights from you, but also pursuing invariably the same object. In other words, like they're taking your rights to put you under despotism. Okay, so like many of our rights that we take for granted were curtailed during the COVID outbreak, uh, but this was not in at least in the wording of the constitution would or the declaration would not justify re revolution 
right? Because it's not just abuses and user patients, right? Regardless of what you thought about the COVID restrictions, that's not enough. It's abuses and user patients that the government undertakes because it's trying to take away free government and replace it with despotism, where you're ruled exclusively by the will of the sovereign, right? Okay, so with all these preliminaries out of the way, we're gonna look at the three major ways these questions were answered in the early Republic, with a special emphasis on the historical context. Then at the end, I'll offer some analytical comments on the pluses and minuses. So we appreciate here the big picture. The big picture is the Constitution doesn't have a clear answer for when we can decide the government has abused its limits. Uh, that had to be sort of settled through uh, the early political history of the United States. And, and we're going to talk about those, and then we'll talk about the pluses and minuses, or, of course, in the case of nullification, really, it's nothing but minuses. Okay, so let's talk to start. Let's talk about um, the idea of nullification, which, unfortunately, comes to us in the earliest instant from, instance from Thomas Jefferson. Uh, and it is unfortunate in many respects because this idea ends up getting picked up later on to justify, uh, frankly, the Civil War. And it was sort of a kind of an unguarded thought that Jefferson had. Jefferson was a visionary, uh, but he often, frankly, lacked common sense. Uh, sort of that lack of common sense, lack of prudence, frankly, uh, sort of creates this seed it ends up growing into Calhounian nullification. So what's the context here? Well, the context is the uh, late 1790s. Now, the 1790s is a period in American history, if you've ever studied, it's really a period of paranoia, backbiting, really nasty partisanship. I would argue even worse than what we have today. Um, it was a period that was dominated by the Federalists, uh, the Federalist Party, uh, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, later John Adams, against what were known as the Republicans, Today, we often call them the Democratic Republicans, but they called themselves Republicans. And in the uh, 1798 election, the midterm election, the Federalists win a huge majority. And they do so on the basis of the brewing uh, tension with France. Uh, at that point, the United States was effectively at war with France. It was an undeclared war. It's remembered in the history books as the Quasi-War. Basically, what we did was we allowed the arming of American merchant boats and the French did the same, and we were firing each other on, over, on the high seas. And the challenge for the Republicans is that they had long been seen as the pro-French party. They had been early advocates of the French Revolution. Of course, the French Revolution began in 1789, and now it had sort of devolved into something much, much, much worse, right? The terror had already occurred. Uh, we're at the cusp of Napoleon's taking over, right? Um, and, uh, and so what ultimately happens is uh, this sort of, there's a fear within the United States of America um, that this sort of French radicalism and the, the French uh, desire among the radical Jacobin faction to tear everything down is going to be important to the United States of America. And D was already here, all right? And so the Federalists passed the Alien Acts, which made it harder to become a naturalized citizen. So the idea here, the motive here is to make it more difficult for radicals to get into the United States. They also passed the Sedition Act, which made it a crime to defame the government, including the president. Now, the Federalists had, you know, the reason for this is they wanted to engender respect in the government, tamp down on radicalism, blah, blah, blah. But also, the political nature of this cannot be understated. I mean, the tell is in the, the law itself, because it was set to expire the day of the inauguration of the next presidency, March 4, 1801. So it was really meant, in many respects, as a way, as a way to shut the Republican newspapers up before the election. All right. the Fed, like I said, the Federalists were worried about a radical element migrating from Europe and upsetting the country. But they were also frustrated by the Republicans' superior use of printing, of printing press, All right. which the Republicans were definitely better at by this point. Although that really had been a double-edged sword uh, for, the, uh, uh, for, the, for, the, for the Republicans because oftentimes the newspapers um, would print things that were bad or damaging uh, for the uh, for the uh, the party leadership, okay. So, and unfortunately, Adam signed it because let's be honest, the Sedition Act is pretty gosh darn unconstitutional. I mean, so we're dealing here with a manifestly unconstitutional piece of legislation. And right, the question becomes, what do we do? It's been duly enacted. It's pretty manifestly unconstitutional. So, what do we do? Many Republican printers 
And this is the other thing. People were sent to jail. Many Republican printers were prosecuted by Federalists on the judicial branch. Some of them even served jail time. So there is uh, real damage being done here on law that's unconstitutional. So what do we do? Now today, the answer would be, well, you take them to court. But judicial review hadn't been established then. And anyway, if you've taken them to court, the court at this point would be overwhelmingly Federalist, right? Because Washington had two terms to fill the original judiciary. Adams has had a term of his own, or at least half of one by this point. We've had, you know, basically 10 years of judicial appointments, all of which are Federalists. The court's not going to be sympathetic to you. So what do you do? It's clearly a violation of the First Amendment. The First Amendment could not be more clear. Congress shall make no law, and especially in the context here. Right? I mean, the context of the First Amendment was to make sure that political speech was protected. And here the Federalists are attacking political speech. Well, this is where we get the Virginia and the Kentucky resolutions. Basically, Jefferson, who at this point is vice president, Madison, who is temporarily retired, although he goes back to the Virginia House of Delegates. He had been in Congress until 1797. He goes home. He take, takes a brief stint in the Virginia House of Delegates. They turn to the states, particularly the two states, Virginia and Kentucky, right, which are really kind of the backbone at this point, particularly Virginia, the backbone of Republicanism, right, the, par the party, I mean. Right? And they write the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Jefferson writes the Kentucky resolutions. Madison writes... The Virginia Resolutions. Now, these often get lumped together. I mean, I've even lumped them together here, the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. But they're really two very distinct pieces of, uh, of argumentation. It's important to tease out the differences because we're going to see here that the differences between Madison and Jefferson are pretty stark. Jefferson suggests in the Kentucky Resolutions that the states can nullify the law. So what does that mean? I alluded to this earlier. The idea of Jefferson argues is that the states are the parties to the original federal compact, the Constitution. And if the federal government has uh, violated the compact, then the states have the right to point it out and not follow the law. And so basically what happens is Jefferson argues in the Kentucky Resolutions that the law, the Sedition Act, is altogether void and of no force. And that is going to be known as nullification is what it's going to come down later as. Madison does something different and really something very interesting. Madison doesn't. Madison was an interesting one for never really losing his cool. And Madison's original argument in 10 and Federalist 10 and 51 are for politics. And he still basically maintains, he goes back to the idea of politics. He uses the word interposition. When, what should happen? The state should interpose themselves between the citizens and the federal government. So what exactly does that mean? Well, Madison later on in a subsequent document, uh, the report of 1800 explains what he meant here. It's an interesting idea. This is, um, before I get to that, like, um, I, I need to do a little vindication of Jefferson here because he's often castigate, castigated for this. And Jefferson's reputation in the last quarter century has shrunk or been diminished to a tremendous de degree and for many, many good reasons. Uh, but I, I think it's unfair uh, to put pin too much of the blame on nullification on Jefferson. He proffers the idea. But you have to understand, his back was absolutely against the law, right? Now, the Federalists had passed a blatantly unconstitutional law. The courts weren't going to intervene. What else was there to do? Right? What else was there to do? This is sort of the idea here. And Jefferson is not just taking some, you know, mildly controversial or fleetingly controversial bill. You know, something that we fight over today. And he's suggesting we, you know, like the state of, you know, Tennessee nullify Obamacare or something like that. This is the Sedition Act. This is a direct assault on your rights as a citizen to meaningfully participate in the public discourse, right? He's not, this is not what he would call a transient cause, right? This is, this is not like me nullifying the borough of Zillianople over having to go one way rather than another. This is a big deal, okay? You know, sure, you could count on the next election, which is what Madison ultimately was. But in fairness to Jefferson, the whole purpose of these acts was effectively to rig the elections. Like I said, the tell, the tell was in the fact that the um, ultimately the laws expired. The law had an expiration date of the second of the next inauguration. So was Jefferson undermining the constitutional regime? Maybe. I mean, Calhoun certainly takes this idea and runs with it to undermine the constitutional regime. We'll talk about this in a second. Madison certainly wasn't. 
But that was only in response to the, the Federalists are launching a direct assault upon them. Right? There is a reason, by the way, Federalism effectively dies in the election of 1801 or the election of 1800. The Federalists were too aristocratic. Uh, they, they were too warmongery, frankly. Um, they needed to be cashiered. All right. So let's talk about Madison. Madison's alternative, I alluded to this a moment ago. His alternative is consistent with Federalist 10 and Federalist 51. Remember, Federalist 10 is the extended republic. Factions come in, they barter, they bargain. Nobody dominates anybody else. You have to come up with a compromise. Federalist 51 is a system of checks and balances. No single agent within the government is able to act in hegemonic fashion. Right? Everybody's got to work with everybody else. So how is an unconstitutional regime to be overcome? Madison's argument here is, hey, the states have a lot of political power. And they should use it. So Madison's argument is ultimately boils down to the idea of politics, right? The state should use their political influence to force policy change. That's what he means by the doctrine of interposition, right? The idea is, is that the states, think about the leverage that the states have. For starters, the state legislatures elected both senators, right? We don't get the direct election of senators until the early 20th century. So they have, the state legislatures can put senators in. But also the states have a lot of credibility. You know, governors of the states can say to their voters, hey, this is this is wrong. We should be doing this. That's what they should that's sort of Madison's argument. The state should use their political power that's been granted to them in the constitutional system to restore the proper balance. So this is what Madison says. So this is text from the Virginia Resolutions. And so the, the point to keep in mind here is Madison's writing this, but he's doing so anonymously. He's writing on behalf of the Virginia House of Delegates of the Virginia Assembly. Jefferson's doing likewise with the Kentucky Resolutions. So he says that this assembly, in other words, the Virginia Assembly, doth explicitly and peremptorily declare that it views the powers of the federal government as resulting from the compact to which the states are party. So that's pretty straightforward. That's sort of Federalism 101. Jefferson had the same view, right? As limited by the plain sense and intention of the instrument constituting that compact. Okay, again, no big deal as no farther valid than they are authorized by the grants enumerated in that compact and that, and that in case of a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the same compact, it's the same compact, in other words, the Sedition Act, the states who are parties thereto have the right and are duty-bound to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil. So this is an important distinction, to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil. Jefferson is willing to grant the states a kind of judicial right. States have the right to strike down the law. Right? That's not what Madison says here. right? And instead, Madison's idea is that the states need to get in here, get into the political mix, right? for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to, to them. And Madison didn't pull this doctrine out of thin air. Ironically, it was F Hamilton in Federalist 26, Hamilton, who had been affiliated and by this point had become the leader of the so-called high Federalist faction, after Washington left the White House and or left the executive office in 1797. Hamilton's the leader of the high Federalist faction. But more than about a decade earlier, Hamilton had written this. Right? This is Hamilton in Federalist 26. If the majority should be really disposed to exceed the proper limits, in other words, the national majority in Congress, the community will be warned of the danger and will have an opportunity of taking measures to guard against it. State legislatures, who will always be not only vigilant, but suspicious and jealous guardians of the rights of the citizens against encroachments from the federal government, will consistently have their attention away to the conduct of the national rulers, and will be ready enough, if anything improper appears, to sound the alarm to the people and not only be the arm, but if necessary, the voice, but if necessary, the arm of their discontent. All right, so the states can you know, sound the alarm. Now, Hamilton takes that farther, talks about the idea of the arm of their discontent, so that implies force, right? but the voice of their discontent, that implies politics. Okay, so we have then, in the wake of 1798, we have two um, competing views, although they're both proffered on behalf of the same policy. And Madison goes in one direction, Jefferson goes in another direction. By 1804, we get a third one. And now to be clear, the notion of judicial review had been kind of in the mix. I mean, it's the source of the uh, 11th Amendment. The court had kind of claimed the power to review uh, to settle disputes between citizens of one state and citizens of another. Uh, I think the case was Chisholm v. Georgia. The 11th Amendment basically says, oh, you don't have that power. And so the court had already kind of tried to break free 
from its seemingly limited constraints. But also, the court had the advantage, if you, if you read Article 3 of the Constitution, it is extremely short. The powers given to the, co the courts are extremely vague. And so, even though it seems like the court can't do very much, the vagueness of the wording creates an opportunity for a third view of how disputes are resolved. And that comes from John Marshall. And I think John Marshall is the most influential member of the original Federalist Party, I'd say. If we take Washington at his word as a nonpartisan, um, which I think we should, uh, and I think he certainly was for you know, five of his eight years, uh, I think that Marshall's only rival is Hamilton, who ends being an intellectual force. But Hamilton cannot build the political coalition to sustain his views that Marshall does. Marshall's a really impressive character. Now, Marshall at this point, um, important to bear in mind about Marshall. Marshall had been a member of the House of Representatives. He had been briefly Secretary of State under Adams. Um, he had been one of the diplomats sent to France that sort of resulted in the so-called XYZ affair. Uh, Marshall is not what we take him as today. I mean, you look at the guy and you think he is a titan of the American founding. I mean, that's what this is meant to convey here. This is Marshall later in life. All right, we're not talking about Marshall in, in, the, in the first term of Jefferson. Marshall's still a very young guy, all right? Uh, and, and this sort of Marshall ends up, this title is called Marshall Makes His Move. Uh, the context here is that Jefferson generally, Jefferson takes the presidency in 1801. He says, we're all Federalists, we're all Republicans. Not every difference of opinion is a difference in principle. It's very similar to Ulysses S. Grant in 18. What was that, 1868, when he says, let us have peace, right? Jefferson had been the chief partisan war maker. In, I'm using that word loosely, war maker. But Jefferson says, let's have peace. And Jefferson follows through on this. It's credit to his administration. He doesn't get the credit he deserves. He doesn't remove Federalist office holders whole stock from the executive branch. He goes slow. He tries to restore a balance between Republicans and Federalists. He does not engage in the kind of systematic patronage politics that would come to define the Jacksonian era. Okay, he takes it easy, but he's more aggressive with the judiciary. He was more he was more aggressive with the federal justice system because the judiciary had been stocked with Federalists. And it was in the judiciary where you see prosecutions by Federalist judges under the Sedition Act. Okay. It's in the judiciary where you see Republican newspaper, basically what they were called with printers, being sentenced to jail or severe fines, right? That to Jefferson is a problem. And it was a problem compounded by the so-called Judiciary Act of 1801. Context of that is that Adams realized that, Adams and the Federalists realize that, they, that they've lost the election of 1800. But um, today, the new president is sworn in on January 22nd. Back then, he, he or she would have been sworn in on March 4th. So there is a longer, what we would call, lame duck session. And the Federalists make incredible use of this, recognizing that their, their power in the Congress and in the executive branch are going to be stripped away. They decide to sort of turn the judiciary into a bulwark of their authority. Uh, and so what they do is they expand the judiciary massively, massively expand the number of uh, office holders within the judiciary so that they, they can go about... Um, Basically, they can go about filling these vacancies with loyal Federalists. And Adams is so aggressive about this that he actually stayed at his desk until 9 p.m. on his last day filing out, filling out commissions. So the, the context of bear in mind, so what is a commission? This is an important, important thing to bear in mind for the controversy. Commission would just be, imagine you've been, you know, in the sort of process of being turned into a judge. You get nominated by the president. You get confirmed by the Senate. The commission would be the last thing. It's your piece of paper you can take to the court and say, here, I'm a judge. Give me my gavel. I'm, I'm, I have the authority to rule. All right, so it's really, that's all it is. It's just a piece of paper. And what's interesting is that Madison and Jefferson have, basically in the first day of office, a big pile, so to speak, of commissions sitting on the desk of the Secretary of State. All right. And they just refuse to de deliver the commissions. They, the idea here is that the person had been nominated, they had been confirmed, the commission had been signed by Adams. All that needed to be done is to give the commissions to the new judges. Madison, who is 
uh, Secretary of State says, no, I'm not going to do that. And just as an aside, it's important to bear in mind that at this point in our history, Secretary of State also served as a kind of home office. All right, like sort of similar, like if you some places around the country have state departments or states have state departments. It was really just meant to manage the business of the, of the state. So like, for instance, in Illinois, the Department of Motor Vehicles is part of the State Department. We don't have a State Department in Pennsylvania, but the State Department in this sense is not the place where foreign policy is settled or, or implemented, which it was, don't get me wrong, but it's that the State Department at this point did the foreign policy stuff and also sort of served as a home office. Okay. So one of the people who didn't get his commission was William Marbury, and he sues Madison. Basically, he asked the court for what's called a writ of mandamus, which is just basically handed over. And under the Judiciary Act of 1789, which, by the way, was the act that created and organized the judiciary, the law, the, the I should say, shouldn't say the law, I should say the controversy went straight to the Supreme Court, where John Marshall was new Chief Justice. All right, John Marshall had been, I think he doesn't get sworn in as Chief Justice until 1801. Now, remember, at this point, too, the Supreme Court hadn't been much anything. Like, John Jay had been Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he resigned that to go off and be Minister Plenipotentiary to France, to England to negotiate the Jay Treaty. Right? Like, you think, can you imagine a situation in which John Roberts, the current Chief Justice, would give up that position for literally any other position? Absolutely not. It's a position of enormous power. But in 1804, by that point, it hadn't become that yet. It was not a very desirable position. As a matter of fact, the, the Supreme Court justices, it was a grueling job. They had to do what is known as writing circuit. Like the circuit courts were actually overseen by the judge, the justices themselves. And so when the Supreme Court was on recess, they would go out to the, their various you know, parts of the country where they had a appellate jurisdiction and sit in circuit. All right. So Marshall is a staunch Federalist. It's actually ironically cousin of Jefferson. Although, in fairness, everybody in, in Virginia at this point is pretty much a cousin of everybody else. He's in a bind. What's he going to do? Um, he's really on the horns of a dilemma here. He could rule with Madison, but that would just look like cowering, right? I mean, Marbury has a pretty good case. Give me my commission. No. Uh, so he could rule with Madison and sort of deny it to Marbury. Or he could rule against Madison which, at first blush, is the, the right choice. You should rule against Madison. But what is to force, what induces Madison, what would induce Madison to follow along, right? I mean, think about the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court doesn't have the power of the army, doesn't have the power of taxation. Hamilton and his famous, was it Federalist, I don't remember, Federalist something, 80-something, maybe 71 or 72, says that the Supreme Court, the courts only have the power of judgment. So... So what's to stop Madison from saying, hey, that's real nice, John, but uh, I'm not going to do that. All right. So M Marshall does something which is really extraordinary. It's, it's, it's really remarkable what he does. And it's a political act. Um, and it is one of the most brilliant, ingenious political acts, I think, in the history of American politics. It's the, it's the equivalent of pulling rabbit out of his hat. He rules for Madison. Ah, oh, but there's a twist on the argument that a portion of the Judiciary Act of 1789 was unconstitutional. You see? So what does Marshall do? He gives Madison his, his ruling. But basically the idea here is that the Judiciary Act allowed Mar Marbury to bring a suit directly to the Supreme Court. Marshall says, oh, Marshall says, oh, well, we don't have that power under the Constitution. The Constitution gives us direct jurisdiction. We can hear where the where the court first resort in these situations, but otherwise all we have is appellate jurisdiction, where we can review the actions of other courts. And Marshall's argument is that the Constitution doesn't give them the right to over oversee this kind of case, and so therefore, because the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, the Judiciary Act of 1789, at least as it pertains to that, is struck down. Right. So this is where we get the idea of the doctrine of judicial review. Now I want you to appreciate the importance of this. Right? The importance of this is, anyway, so Marshall argued that this ran contrary to Article 3, which only gives the Supreme Court appellate jurisdiction. So Madison and Jefferson get their ruling, but 
Marshall established the precedent that the court could decide what is and is not constitutional. Now, I have to specify what I mean by that, because obviously it's the nature of the Article Three itself. The court is going to have a role. But what Marshall establishes here is basically that the court will have the final role. Right? What's the recourse to a Supreme Court decision that you don't like? You only have two. You can either wait for enough justices to die or resign so you can replace and change the character of the court, or you can pass a constitutional amendment. We've had to do that twice. We did that with the 11th Amendment. We did it with the 16th Amendment. You don't like a Supreme Court ruling, you got to get five, I'll put it this way. Five justices on the Supreme Court can only be overruled by two-thirds of the Congress and three-quarters of the states. That's judicial review. That is different, and I really want to emphasize this. That is different than what the founders would have envisioned. All right, this was not on the table in Philadelphia in 1787. And I guarantee you in many respects that the, 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 this is more consistent with the anti-federalists' warnings about the potential power of the judiciary, right? Because the judiciary is the far and away the least democratic branch, okay? So, and John Marshall is chief justice until 1835. It's a long time. It's a point of comparison. Marshall's chief justice basically for 34 years. Clarence Thomas, who is one of the other longest serving, he's currently the longest serving member of the Supreme Court. He's been on the court since 1991. So he's been on the court for 31 years. Marshall was on even longer than Thomas has been. And he, Marshall uses the power of judicial review exclusive from that point forward, exclusively against the states. Right? He's a staunch Federalist who believes in a strong federal government, and so he uses judicial review time and time again to assert the authority of the feds against the power of the states. And he does it very this is why it's argued earlier that Marshall ends up being, you know, arguably the most important Federalist. Because Marshall's on the court for the next 30 years, and he uses it to establish the supremacy in practice, the supremacy of the federal government. Right? So his rulings basically can constrain the power of the states to interfere on national issues. Okay, so now we have three visions. We have Jeffersonian nullification, we have Madisonian interposition, and we have judicial review. Marshall, I want to emphasize here, Marshall does not use judicial review against another federal law for the remainder of his career. Between Marbury versus Madison and the Civil War, there's only other one federal law that struck down. And well, it's basically like all the federal laws pertaining to slavery are struck down in Dred Scott v. Sanford in 1857. Marshall doesn't do that. So it's, it's a testament to his political skill. He's an incredible politician. Okay. All right. And what's interesting about this is that the Jeffersonians, they don't have a good response. I mean, you could imagine a scenario. So Jefferson looks at this. He looks at the court, uh, which is now highly federalist and extending its power, right? the power of judicial review. Well, we have recourse. Well, what can we do? Well, we can remind the courts who's actually in charge through the power of impeachment. So that's what they do. Or they try to, at least. The Republicans in Congress under Jefferson impeach a judge. I don't remember his name. Um, I should remember his name. It's in my book. I don't remember. But they impeached a district judge from New Hampshire. Uh, but he had basically gone insane. Even his son said he needed to be removed from the bench. But because he was insane, he had to get him. To, he wouldn't agree to it, and that's the only way he could get him. So they impeach and convict him. The real action is with this guy right there, which is Samuel Chase. All right. So frustrated by the Federalist character of the courts, Jefferson encourages Congress, which is run by Republicans, to use uh, the impeachment power. Let's start removing these guys. We don't like them. Let's remove them. That's politics too. They could do that if they want. The most obvious candidate is Samuel Chase. He was drunk. He's a drunk. He's a foul-mouthed Federalist. He's known for haranguing juries from the bench of, over the Sedition Act. And if that's not enough, he basically profited, like he used infor inside information to basically try and corner the market on flour in the city of New York during the Revolutionary War. Okay, not a sympathetic guy. House of Representatives impeaches him. And they impeach him at the very end of the recess, at the very end of the session. And then they go to the next session. Chase is ready. Chase and his lawyers mount a very effective argument. Meanwhile, the House's lawyer or the House's advocate, the manager of the impeachment, is John Randolph of Roanoke. If you ever know anything about John Randolph of Roanoke, he's an absolute character. He was crazy. He used to bring his dogs on the floor of the Supreme Court, but he's also like really short, really slight. He had really high voice, um, probably some kind of genetic disorder. But everybody, like people were terrified of this guy. But 
he was a he was the sort of guy who usually added more heat than light. And Randolph harangues the Senate, but uh, to no effect, Chase is acquitted. He was acquitted in the Senate. So what does that effectively create? It effectively creates the precedent that, you know, you really can only remove people on the judiciary for malfeasance. You don't necessarily have to be. Uh, you know, the phrase high crimes and misdemeanors is, I think, reserved exclusively to the presidency. You know, we don't use uh, the impeachment power as like, oops, we shouldn't put that guy on the, on the, on the, on the, on the judiciary. You know? I remember in, uh, when I was a teenager, they uh, nominated, the Bush administration nominated David Souter who had been a, uh, to the Supreme Court, he had been a uh, justice at the New Hampshire Supreme Court. And the thinking on the Bush administration was that his record was so thin that the liberals in Congress wouldn't be able to figure out that he's a conservative. Well, it turned out he was a liberal. Um, Souter ends up voting, being a leader on the liberal bloc. You know, the Republicans take control of Congress in 94. There's never any talk about impeaching him. I mean, they don't even like think about it. It's, it's be unthinkable. It's just not something that's done. Okay, But that's politics too. So the court remains Federalist, although between Marshall's pragmatism and Jefferson's moderation, uh, there's no subsequent political fallout. What do I mean by that? Well, what Jefferson's moderation. He doesn't, Jefferson actively tries to absorb like half of the Federalist Party into the Republican Party. And he's remarkably successful. If you look at the 1804 election, it's remarkable. Jefferson wins like half of the states of New England, which had been a bastion of Federalism. So between that and between Marshall's sensibility, you get this sort of like lowering of the weapons, but it also creates a political space for judicial review to become, to be seen as the norm. Okay. Now, it would seem at this point that this is the way things go. The Supreme Court is in charge, but that's not, that's, but, but still though, and, and certainly judicial review is being entrenched here, but there's still this other notion or multiple other notions that are still in the mix. Nullification is still in the mix, right? And it has a seemingly respectable pedigree coming as it does from the Kentucky resolutions, right? So we need to skip ahead here. We were talking, so the last time we left off was like 1805. So now we're gonna skip ahead to the 1820s. Now we get the question of tariffs. And when we're talking about tariffs under Adams, I don't mean John Adams, I mean his son, John Quincy Adams, who was president from 1825 until 1829. So tariffs are taxes on imported goods. And tariffs had been, until the creation of the income tax with the 16th Amendment, and, and really up until like the World War II, tariffs had been the main source of federal revenue for the United States government, taxes on imported goods. Uh, but there was a question of, well, couldn't tariffs be used to help American industry develop? This is known as industrial protection, which is still something people nowadays tend to be on the right. They used to be on the left, but now they're on the right to talk about. Like, let's raise tariffs on imported goods so we can give space for home industries to thrive. Hamilton had supported this idea. Madison, uh, in 1815, signs into law what was known as the Dallas Tariff, uh, which, was a, which was the first truly protective tariff. Um, and that had, had pretty widespread support, but it was a moderately protective tariff. Now, the context to keep in mind here, as we go from the 18-teens into the 1820s, there's a new census in 1820, and new census means reapportionment. And pa political power accrues to New England, to the Mid-Atlantic, increasingly to the Midwest. Right? These places are growing rapidly. The South is growing less rapidly. These places want tariffs. New England and the Mid-Atlantic especially, because they're manufacturing goods. They don't want to compete with British goods from overseas. The South, on the other hand, doesn't want tariffs, because the South is not a manufacturing economy. The South, instead, is an agricultural economy, and in particular, what the South does is it exports its cash crops, cotton or tobacco, and increasingly cotton. Right? Tariffs do no good for Southerners. In fact, they do a lot of harm because it just increases the prices of the farm equipment that they need to buy, right? That farming is a very capital intensive industry and all the capital investments that farmers have to make, tariffs on imported, imported farm equipment from Great Britain are gonna raise the prices. So the tariff ends up going from potentially something that united the country to you know, one side, two sides advantage 
one side is worse. Okay. There's a tariff passed in 1824 that's very protective, and it begins the process of radicalizing the Southerners. The bigger story here is that the South realizes that they are becoming a political minority in the country. And that, by the way, was not their expectation when the Constitution was ratified. They thought the South would end up growing and growing and growing. But here we get industry, we get immigration, uh, we get cultural tolerance, uh, we don't have slavery in the North. All of these reasons are people are, the North is growing, okay? Like, just to put this in perspective, I'm pretty sure by 1820, Ohio is roughly as large as Virginia, which is insane. Because Virginia was far and away the largest state in 1787. Ohio had only been admitted as a state in, I think, 1804. And for it to have grown that quickly, that fast, is extraordinary. Okay? So, John Quincy Adams, who's the president in, uh, becomes president in 1824. Favored protection, and he and Henry Clay, who's his sort of top political lieutenant, Secretary of State knew that they had to pass a protective tariff in 1828. The only way they're going to win re-election is if they if if they win over these the, the New England they expected to go into their pocket, but they got to win Pennsylvania and they want to win Ohio. And if you want to win Pennsylvania in the 1820s, you got to you got to do industrial protection. All right, so it's a political calculation. South was against it, but Quincy Adams his coalition wasn't in the South. Quincy Adams coalition was basically, you know, New England plus the Mid-Atlantic plus maybe some Western states. The West was on the fence, and this was an important point because you could design the tariff in such a way to sort of buy off certain Western interests. Like if you, you know, you were sheep uh, herder in the West, you could do tariffs on imported woolen goods. That's good for you. All right, even though you're involved in agriculture, you want to sell uh, your wool uh, so that you know. And if it's harder for people to buy woolen goods from overseas, they're going to be, you know, the woolen manufacturers are going to are going to prosper. And if they prosper, that means you prosper. So there was a way to sort of buy off the West with tariffs. All right. Now, Jackson, who is his main opponent in the 1828 election, is on the fence about the tariff. He has to be. Because Jackson's coalition is the South, but Jackson needs Pennsylvania too. Okay. So Jackson cannot come out and say, oh, I'm for the tariff or I'm against the tariff. He's got to kind of dance around the issue. And he and his supporters in Congress, including this fellow right here, this is the only president from our state of Pennsylvania, also in my opinion, the worst president in American history. That's uh, uh, Tencent Jimmy, as he was sort of derided during his administration, James Buchanan. He's a member of the House of Representatives at this point. He was a staunch Jacksonian. Uh, he's part of the guys who hatched this scheme. Jackson's allies in Congress hatched a scheme to make the tariff work for them. And it was one, one of those things that's too clever by half. Northern Jackson allies. So Jackson, Jackson, there's Jackson men who end up getting called Democrats, but they're not called Democrats at this point. They're often called, referred to as the Jackson men. The Jackson men in the North, in, in Northern Jackson men in Congress, write a tariff law that is like over the top, filled with all sorts of like, you know, like ridiculous, you know, made no sense. Okay. The Jackson men from the South don't offer any amendments to fix it. So the House of Representatives passed this ridiculous tariff that jacks rates up to levels not seen until the Great Depression. The thinking was that it would be too much for New England to accept. And they actually wrote it in a way to basically, you know, like mess with New England. Okay. So the idea was is that Adams' own allies in the in the Senate would be responsible for its defeat. Okay. But what happens is, oh, and I should add too, this is really cynical for American politics at this point. And it speaks to the level of politics that Jackson, Jacksonianism brings. You get this sort of hyper, increasingly democratic politics. You get, uh, I think I have one book on the era called Rude, Rude Republic. Um, really speaks to uh, the vibe. The sort of old aristocratic style ethos of the better sorts governing the country. Like a Madison or, or, or Gallatin. Uh, is disappearing and this is the sort of thing not even Jefferson would have cooked up against Hamilton all right but there's a twist as there always is in American politics Jackson men miscalculated in the Senate a series of amendments are added that made the bill more acceptable to New England so it passes the Senate goes back to the house passes the house Adams recognizes that it's over the top but he still signs it into law he thought it was a bad bill but more to bear in mind before Jackson Presidents usually only vetoed bills when they thought they were unconstitutional. 
Presidents typically did not veto bills that they thought were bad pieces of legislation. Adams thought it was constitutional, so he signs it into law. So we get this bill that becomes known as the Tariff of Abominations. That's what it gets called to. And the South is outraged over this, over this Tariff of Abominations. And in fairness to the South, frankly, they had good reasons to be. The, and, and they had good constitutional reasons to be. I'm not saying it's a slam dunk case, and I'm not saying that I agree with them. But you've got to hand it to them. Right? Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution gives Congress the power to, to tax for the general welfare. How is this consistent with the general welfare? It doesn't give Congress the right to burden one region for the benefit of the rest. Or the politi political ambitions of an old war criminal. That's sort of a reference to Jackson's many illegal actions up in the East let me start on Andrew Jackson. I just can't resist dumping on Andrew Jackson whenever I have to teach about him. And another thing, too, slavery is lurking in the background here, right? Um, because the South is just increasingly different. The South is, un economically, the South is quite unlike the North and the West. Now, it had been because of the institution of slavery. It had always been. But it was becoming more so. The North and West are industrializing and they're growing. The South is not industrializing. Its population is generally stagnant. This is a democracy. If the North and West could gang up on the South over tariffs, what's to say they won't do the same with slavery as well? All right, and that leads to the nullification crisis. And this fellow right here, this is John C. Calhoun. This would be Calhoun around the time that he was Secretary of War under Monroe, and then later Vice President. All right, this is another, you can find uh, dogger types of Calhoun from when he was an old man dying of tuberculosis. He looks like death incarnate, to be <laughs> to be honest. So this is Calhoun as a younger man. So Jackson, like I had mentioned, had been cagey on the issue of the tariff in 1828. Uh, he gets into the White House, overwhelming support for the from the South. Jackson calculates that he can continue to, he doesn't have to wheel back this tariff. In his first presidential administration, he said that the tariff of abominations hadn't been that bad. So it looks like Jackson's going to keep the tariff. And it's smart politics for Jackson to do that because, frankly, winning over Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York is more politically useful to Jackson than winning over South Carolina, Georgia, and Mississippi, and Alabama. All right, this was deeply disappointing to the planters of the South, particularly Virginia and South Carolina. They're placed under a legitimate hardship by this tariff. It's also important to bear in mind that at the end of the 18-teens, there was an agro, uh, uh, it was known as the Panic of 1819, and it produced this deep, long-standing agricultural depression. Uh, and it, it's really more than anything else, like what tips Jefferson's Monticello, which fails. Jeff when Jefferson dies, he's so deep in debt, um, he can't free his slaves. Madison, when he dies, he's so deep in debt, he can't free his slaves. Uh, the agricultural depression that happens in the 1820s is just a nightmare for these guys. And ironically, it ends up pushing the South more and more into slavery because one of the solutions that uh, the old plantation people in places like Virginia uh, came up with was basically breeding enslaved people for sale. Uh, this becomes a means of economic prosperity. And in fact, by the time of the Civil War, Enslaved people are the store of Southern wealth rather than agriculture, which is really remarkable when you think about it, right? Um, so this panic is having an enormous effect, transforming not only the Southern economy, but also Southern culture and Southern views about slavery, where it was seen as something between an embarrassment and a necessary evil around the time of the Constitution. Now it's being seen more and more as a positive good. Calhoun is going to reflect this view. Calhoun is going to become the great champion of the Southern agricultural slavocratic interests. All right. So Calhoun is a really smart guy. He's really an impressive guy in many, many respects. Ultimately, he has to be judged in the negative. Um, but he had a promising start in Congress. He frankly was on track to become president of the United States. You know, after you know, maybe Quincy Adams and Jackson, uh, he was that level of talent. It's unfortunate, uh, though, because his intelligence and, frankly, his nationalism, he went to Yale, as a matter of fact. He went to Yale. He was the author in the House of Representatives of the Second Bank of the United States bill. He was a nationalist. He was integral in reorganizing American military 
the American military administration after the War of 1812, which ends up being hugely important to the Mexican-American War. We get the creation of a permanent, competent, bureaucratic staff to manage the army and Calhoun. But he abandons all of that into this, what I'm calling here, morally benighted advocacy of the slaveocracy. Right? The slaveocrats are going to be those southern elites who, have a, who, have, who, who dominate politics on the basis of their ownership of other people. And he offers a novel constitutional theory called nullification. Now, Jefferson hinted at nullification, but it's really sort of this phrase, this classic Jefferson, a phrase that he should have put some more time and thought into. Calhoun draws this out. And I gave you in your readings this week is the so-called Fort Hill Address that expands on Calhoun's doctrine of nullification. So what does Calhoun argue? Calhoun argues basically draw... Now, Calhoun is... It's not just Jefferson. Calhoun is very good at picking and choosing ideas and phrases and things in the Federalist Papers and the Virginia Resolutions and the... Uh, in the Kentucky Resolutions to stitch together an argument that this is the legitimate understanding of the Constitution. All right, and it, it draws off this idea as the states being parties to the federal compact, which is uncontroversial, or at least it should be. Right, but Calhoun takes it farther. He, he argues that the states remained sovereign in their own spheres. Okay, so if you've ever heard the phrase dual sovereignty, this is often where it comes from. Calhoun called it uh, the theory of the concurrent majority. There's two majorities acting simultaneously in the United States of America. The national majority deals with strictly national issues as defined by the Constitution. Majorities in the states deal with strictly state issues as defined by everything the Constitution leaves to the states. Whenever the federal government intervened in the state sphere, or in other words, when the national majority enters an area that is appropriately the domain of the state majority, a state had the right to declare that law null and void. And he offers this argument, does it anonymously? He's vice president under Jackson. Does it anonymously? Everybody knows it's him. And so this is what South Carolina does. It nullifies the tariff of abominations, declares it altogether null, null and void and of no effect in the state of South Carolina. Jackson was outraged. Right? Jackson, Jackson basically promises to march an army down to South Carolina and hang the first nullifier he finds from the first tree he finds. Right? Jackson was outraged. Now, Henry Clay, who is at this point had been Secretary of State to Adams, he returned uh, to the, he's back in the Senate from Kentucky. He works behind the scenes with Calhoun to cut a deal, compromise tariff that brings tariff rates back down. All right, and so the nullification is withdrawn, or at least technically. Calhoun's national career is over, and he ends up getting replaced by Martin Van Buren in 1833. But the doctrine of nullification is still lurking there. And if you look at the Articles of Secession that the Southern states draw up in 1861, and in the case of South Carolina, 1860, you will see them rely on the notion of nullification, that the federal government, in their efforts to regulate slavery, had intervened and interfered in a domain that properly belongs to the states. And because the states are the party to the original federal compact, they have the right to respond to this assault on their rights by seceding. It's basically the argument. Now, Jackson's alternative was, uh, no, you don't, and I'm going to march an army down here and prove you otherwise, which is exactly what Lincoln does. Okay, so Jackson, in this regard, I'm not a big Jackson fan, uh, but Jackson lays the groundwork for Lincoln's justification uh, to, uh, uh, you know, carry on the Civil War. So we have then three big alternatives here that, that end up. And again, you know, we take for granted the doctrine of judicial review. But I want you to appreciate that judicial review emerges from a competition of multiple ideas. And I would say, and I don't have it in the slides here, but judicial review was severely undermined by Dred Scott. Okay, Dred Scott in 1857, if you don't know the facts of the Dred Scott case, Dred Scott was an enslaved person who uh, was moved up to Wisconsin. I believe it was Wisconsin. And his, his slave owner, his owner, uh, died. And his widow was like, okay, we're going to Missouri. Come on now. And Scott says, uh, no, I'm free now. We're in the north. I'm free. Uh, and, and so it's 
controversy here, and the controversy goes to the Supreme Court. Roger Tawney, who was one of Jackson's henchmen uh, in his bank war, um, rules in Dred Scott v. Sanford. Uh, no, you're not, Scott. You were property. And the Constitution is very clear that property, you can only have property taken away from you under due process of law. And therefore, the fact that you were in the North for so long is irrelevant. And what Tawney really does there is strike down the Compromise of 1850. He strikes down the Missouri Compromise. He even strikes down the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 and basically transforms the entire country into a slave-owning nation where if you have slaves in the South and you bring them to the North, you cannot be dispossessed of them except under due process, which means like a court trial. Uh, and this creates, this leads to the Civil War. It can draw a straight line from uh, the uh, uh, Lincoln, uh, excuse me, Kansas, Nebraska to Bleeding Kansas to Dred Scott and, and Lincoln in the, uh, Abraham Lincoln, when he's debating Stephen Douglas in Illinois in this famous Lincoln Douglas debates, puts Douglas on the spot because Douglas had been a, 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 an advocate of what was known as popular sovereignty. Douglas wanted to let the territories and the states decide whether or not they could have slavery or not. And Lincoln says, well, which is it, Douglas? Are you with Dred Scott or are you with popular sovereignty? You can't be for both. Because if you accept Dred Scott, then slavery goes everywhere. And Douglas says, I'm not with the Supreme Court. So the Supreme Court, uh, judicial review was almost destroyed. Uh, really, the, the reason it was saved, frankly, is because the North wins the Civil War. Okay. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well. Let's evaluate these. There's no surefire way to resolve disputes about our rights. Right? That's an analogous to what we called at the beginning of the quarter the essential problem of government. There's no way to design a perfect government. And so, of course, there's no way to design a perfect system to decide whether or not that government is behaving the way it should be. Right? We have to choose between competing alternatives that are all going to be less than perfect because human beings are too selfish. And what we really need is a neutral arbiter that doesn't exist. There is nobody who is capable of putting their passions aside and embracing the notion of true justice, at least not in a way that you can count on that person or entity or group in a reliable fashion. Maybe you can get some people for a while, but as Polybius argued, you know, sooner or later, their idiot kids are going to screw everything up. All right. But even if we admit that none of these alternatives are... are perfect it doesn't mean they're all equally valid each of them has problems and let's take them in opposite order of their virtue so we're going to start with the doctrine of nullification all right which is far and away the worst okay the doctrine of nullification basically if it was accepted it would destroy the constitution or return us effectively to the articles of confederation it would destroy the national union okay nullification is simply unworkable it is incompatible with the principles of Republican government, where the majority has the right and authority to rule. Think of it this way. The states, ultimately, it gets to this sort of issue of neutrality. If the state feels aggrieved by the federal government, it doesn't possess the neutrality necessary to act as a judge. States are all, you, you see this in politics all the time. Right? People are mad because something affects their interests, and they're this is this is an assault on our sacred liberties. It's like, no, it's not. You're, you're just all worked up. You know, it's hard for us to disentangle the dictates of justice and the demands of our personal interests, right? I mean, you, if you read, you read the ordinances of secession, they're paranoid thinking, you know? They go against every sort of statement that Lincoln had made saying, I'm not going after slaves in your states, right? They're, they're, it's paranoia. And that's a problem when, when your interests are threatened. You cannot be a neutral judge, right? But that's what nullification gives the states the power to do that. It creates a clear conflict of interest. The aggrieved party becomes the judge. That's not going to work. Also, taken to its extreme, nullification is a dagger to the heart of Republican government because it gives the minority the power to interpret the Constitution above the majority, right? Let's say you want to enact a tariff law. And one state says, nope, it's unconstitutional, can't have it. Well, look, if one state's not going to follow the, the rules, then the entire regime is going to collapse, right? Because what will happen? You know, 
South Carolina lowers tariffs on on goods, Great Britain's just going to drive all the commercial traffic into South Carolina. So basically, you create a situation in which a minority can overrule the majority. Now, admittedly, there are instances where the minority should have the final say. But again, the minority, in this case, would not have the dispassion necessary, right? Madison really gets to this, and this is one of your assigned readings. I want you to read this letter Madison wrote uh, to Edward Everett. So the context of this letter is Madison is, at this point, an old man, okay? He's 79 years old. Uh, Jefferson's dead. Monroe's dead. Um, he is still in reasonably good health, although his health is going to quickly fail. And Calhoun makes it several mistakes, but political mistake he makes is offering an interpretation of the Federalist Papers and the Virginia Resolutions. Well, James Madison is still alive and still with it. James Madison, his cognitive faculties never gave out. He died from basically rheumatoid arthritis and he had a bad flu in 1831 and he never recovered and he just kind of withered away. But there was no point at which his, his, his mind ever left him. If anything, he's more wise at this point in 1830 than maybe any American who had ever lived up to that point because he's seen so much. Madison is alive and he's well and he's in his right mind and he gets, it's a really interesting story. There's this debate in the Senate between Robert Hayne of South Carolina, who's advocating nullification, and Daniel Webster from Massachusetts, who are opposed to it. Hayne sends a copy of his speech to Madison and says, hey, what do you think about this? Madison writes this long essay in the form of a letter, basically tearing Hayne's arguments apart. And then he sends it to this fellow Edward Everett, who is the editor of the North American Review. And Everett publishes it. So imagine if Madison puts his credibility on the line as he's already been celebrated as the father of the Constitution at this point. Madison coming out of retirement basically one last time to denounce this constitutional heresy. It's a hugely important moment. All right. it, and, and Madison, that's not all he did too. Madison, Madison's personal secretary um, became an advisor to Jackson and Madison during the nullification period a couple years later when Jackson's fighting the nullifiers writes, you know, um, Nicholas Triss is his name. He writes Triss all these letters, arguments that Triss sort of passes off to Jackson. It's really impressive what Madison does. Okay, Madison tears the whole thing apart. So can more be necessary to demonstrate the inadmissibility of such doctrine, in other words, nullification, than that it puts it in the power of the smallest fraction over one fourth of the United States, that is of seven states out of 24, which are the number of states, to give the law and even the constitution to 17 states. Now, what's the argument there? Because what's the workaround from nullification? South Carolina nullifies it. How do you override South Carolina? You got to write a constitutional amendment. That's what Madison's getting at, right? Each of the 17 having as parties to the Constitution an equal right with each of the seven to expound it and to insist on it, the, the exposition. That the seven might, in particular instances, be right and the 17 wrong is more than possible. In other words, South Carolina might have a point. And frankly, they did have a point. But to establish a positive and permanent rule Giving such power to such a minority over such a majority would overturn the first principle of free government because we would go from the majority ruling to the minority ruling and in practice, in practice necessarily overturn the government itself. Right? Madison sees this for the danger that it is. He sees the scepter or the specter, I should say, of disunion in this. This is an argument for disunion. All right. Madison believed that the solution should be political, and it's the same idea, right? Politics. So what do we do, Madison, sort of this, the, this sort of thing here? Okay, there's an unconstitutional law. There's a law that South Carolina doesn't like. What do, what do they have recourse to do? A lot. He says, on the other hand, as, as opposed to nullification, as a security of the rights and powers of the states in their individual capacities against an undue preponderance of the powers granted to the government over them in their united capacity, the Constitution has relied on, one, the responsibility of the senators and representatives in the legislature of the United States, the legislatures and peoples of the states. So the con congressional delegations are supposed to be responsive to states. The responsibility of the president of the people of the United States, you got the president there. The liability of the executive and judiciary functions of the United States to impeachment by the representatives of the people in one branch and by trial by the representatives of the states. So you don't like what the president's doing, impeach him. State functionaries, legislative, executive, and judiciary being at the same time in their appointment and responsibility, altogether independent of the agency and authority of the United States. So you don't like something? The Constitution sets up 
a system of checks and balances. Fight it out through politics. That's Madison's argument. And in fact, that's what Clay does. This is why I'm such a big fan of Henry Clay. Clay cuts a deal. That's politics, right? That's Madison's answer, all right? So I think nullification is a doctrine that's best left in the dustbin of history. Let's talk about judicial review, obviously. Um, you know, criticism of uh, Madison's view. Do we really want to leave our rights to the political process? I mean, our rights, because after all, I mean, our rights exist. You know, if you accept natural law doctrine, which I think most people do, even if they don't want to admit it, you know, our rights exist prior to the creation of politics. Do we really want to leave their arbitration on, on most sacred rights to a political process? I mean, we've seen as we've been going through this lecture how everybody's got mixed motives, right? That's what politics is all about, right? Madison has great faith in politics, and I, and I, and I do as well. But this is a big ask, okay? Politics is usually a forum for determining mutually agreeable compromises, but resolving the proper scope of government, do we really want to leave that up to Congress? Right? Complete dispassion is impossible, but maybe we could find an institution where they could be a little dispassionate, right? A group, I don't know, a group of say nine men and women <laughs> who don't have a dog in the hunt or at least a manifest dog in the hunt, right? This is the advantage of judicial review, right? Because the judiciary is the most re removed from the political process. And if any institution in our country is capable of dispassion, it's the judiciary, right? It Because judges are appointed for life tenure. So, and as we saw with Samuel Chase, it's really hard to remove them, okay? So that's the advantage of judicial review. Giving the courts the final say on the nature of our rights has the advantage of you actually get a group of people who maybe hopefully can be neutral. It also has the advantage of building precedent to resolve disputes, right? I mean, that's really what, you know, case law is. It's sort of this kind of common law tradition that the court has created since its beginning, sort of like this is how we resolve these disputes. It's not just what the Constitution says, but we go back and we look at what we have said before. So in other words, there's sort of this view of the continuity of the court, the membership might change, but the judgment of the court remains in place, which implies that justices follow previous judgments. That's known as stare decisis, right? That case law, prior case law, creates these ways to resolve disputes, that the court has spent time thinking about what each of these clauses in the Constitution mean, what they require, what the proper relationship between the branches are, and these serve as intricate sort of guides for resolving disputes. That's another advantage, right? That's an advantage from life tenure that judges can actually develop this over time. There's lots of advantage, but there's problems, right? Do judges really reflect our values? I mean, I think on the current Supreme Court, eight of the nine are graduates from either Harvard or Yale Law. If you look over time as well, especially in the Gilded Age, the Supreme Court justices were often creatures of the economic, sort of the so-called robber barons, the economic elites. Um, during the middle of the 20th century, the justices advocated for progressive values on culture and society that were in keeping with intellectuals in academia, but far from uh, the values of average Americans. So, you know, it's dispassion is good, but we want people who are dispassionate who are like us. And are, is the Supreme Court really like us? Uh, and then what do we do when the justices are wrong? I mean, like I said, the 11th Amendment and the 16th Amendment are products of, you know, overturning, um, you know, the, the, the uh, Supreme Court rulings. And you could argue as well, the 15th Amendment in part is an overturning of Dred Scott. And judges also have to play politics, right? Um, an example of this is uh, the, uh, when Marshall ruled um, that the Cherokees had rights under the treaty obligations and that the state of Georgia couldn't go in and seize their land. Jackson was very ironic because Jackson was an aggressive advocate of federal authority 
in the case of the nullifiers, but he really looked the other way when the southern states went against the Native American lands. And he is said to have said, John Marshall has made his ruling, now let him enforce it. So justices have to play politics, right? And we saw the disaster when they don't, when they misread the political climate, the disastrous results in Dred Scott. I think another good example is Obergefell versus Hodges, which was the case from a couple years ago that legalized gay marriage. There's no way that that ruling would have come down in 2007. In 2007, the majority of Americans were opposed to gay marriage. The only way that Anthony Kennedy could make that ruling is he read the political polls. So judges are themselves not neutral arbiters. They themselves play politics. And you see, you know, a lot of times Chief Justice John Roberts tries to do this for the sake of the brain, the court's um, uh, institutional credibility. So judges play politics as well. Um, and because they should say because judicial they should say because judicial review is not in the Constitution, it is fragile. It's dependent upon the other branches of the government recognizing its legitimacy. If they stop recognizing it, in other words, if Mississippi were to pass a law outlawing abortion, there is nothing the court alone could do. There is nothing the court alone could do. The court does not have the power of the sword. They do not have the power of the purse. All they have is the power of judgment. They cannot enforce their decrees without the cooperation of the other branches. And this is one of the things, like we talk about court packing, that's something uh, the Democrats and progressives are talking about. Court packing, let me tell you something. If either side changes the current composition of the Supreme Court, they will destroy judicial review. And we will go back to something like Madisonian interposition or politics as a resolution of constitutional disputes. If the, if the liberals pack the Supreme Court and the liberals strike down some federal initiative on uh, you know, regulatory initiative promulgated by a Republican, there is no way that Republican president is going to abide by it. They'll just ignore it. They'll say exactly what, right? John Marshall has made his ruling. Now let him enforce it. All right. And we might see, we might see this in our lifetimes. I mean, the rhetoric over the Supreme Court is getting more and more heated. We might get to a point where the court is too ideologically polarized. Nobody believes that it is a place of dispassionate justice. Everybody believes that it is a place where the parties enact their ideological agendas on a very high constitutional level. If that continues as a view to be sustained and expanded, we could see places begin to ignore the rulings of the court. The court's legitimacy is not a guarantee. Okay, some final thoughts for you. So in this class, we pose four questions. Right? What is the purpose of government? What limits a liberal government? How should a liberal government be organized to respect those limits? And how should violations of disputes under the liberal order be arbitrated? Last one is our question for tonight. The Constitution provides us the least guidance on the fourth question. Right? The Constitution is, it gives us a very clear understanding of the purpose of government right? in the preamble, in the enumeration of powers in Article 1, Section 8. Structure of the government um, and the limits that are outlined as well. The Constitution sets these first three down pretty clearly. The fourth, fourth one, very ambiguous. Very ambiguous. It was something that had to be resolved through politics. It was, it was a judicial review is not something that just existed when the Constitution was ratified. Instead, it had to develop, right? And on this question, contingency mattered the most. Events play out in a slightly different way. You could get something very different, right? If Marshall had been less politically pragmatic, if the Jeffersonians had been more thoughtful in their efforts to unpack the bench of Federalists, you could have seen something very different. You could have also seen judicial review if the South had chosen, frankly, if the South had chosen, had not chosen to secede in 1861. There was no way the North was going to obey the ruling in Dred Scott. There was no way that could have destroyed judicial review as well. So contingency mattered the most in all of these questions. But the big point here for this class is that none of these questions admit of unequivocal answers. Reasonable people can disagree on the purpose of government, what 
a liberal government should do, how a liberal government should be designed, how should violations under the liberal order be arbitrated. Reasonable people can disagree. And so I guess in the final analysis here, I think, I hope that one of the things that you've taken from this class is maybe more questions than answers, um, that you can appreciate that your answers to these various questions Maybe you've historically in your life up to this point have taken them for granted. Maybe you haven't, um, but that you can appreciate that a lot of things that we take for granted are really a product of time and place and where we find ourselves in the world and at a particular time. And it can be useful um, to sort of evaluate that, not as a way to embrace relativism. Well, you know, you live your way and I'll live mine, but really it's a way to understanding different views and maybe hopefully I think sharpening our own opinions and becoming more firm and develop a greater understanding of why we think the way we do and I hope in this lecture series you've you've appreciated a couple things the virtues of limited government the reasons for limited government right the liberal vision of the role of the state the importance of the development in designing the state to make sure it follows those rules, and ultimately, at the consequence of tonight's lecture, the challenges of resolving those disputes. So that's all I have for you, um, everybody. Thank you for listening, and thanks for your attention in class. I really enjoyed it, and like I said, I'm, I'm re really disappointed. Uh, I really wish I hadn't. Obviously, nobody ever wants to get sick, but I was very disappointed to have to uh, email Robert today and say, I, I can't make it. Um, I'm feeling too punky because I was really looking forward uh, to getting together with all of you one last time. Uh, and those of you who are going on and graduating, I, I really wish you the best of luck. Um, and uh, good luck to you. And I, and I hope your futures are exciting. I think as Grove City students, you certainly have gotten a first rate education. Uh, and I, I'm confident that you'll do well. Uh, and those of you who are coming back, like I said, I'm teaching a class on Congress next year. If you find my lecture style interesting and sort of mix of history and big picture stuff, um, you know, feel free. I'd, I'd love to see you in that class next spring. All right, take care, everybody.